So Michelle, we last had you in um, with us in October. We talked about tobacco harm reduction and mental health in aid of World Mental Health Day, which was a great conversation that we had. Um, so what have you been up to since then? Do you have any news either personally or professionally? Yeah, so I've been working at Reason now for about eight months, I think. It's been wonderful. Uh, personal news, not much, you know, not, uh, world's opening up, all that's great. A lot has been happening, obviously, in the tobacco harm reduction space. It's just, I mean, if you talk to anybody in this space, the last couple of months have been absolutely brutal. Uh, just a uh, an onslaught of state and local legislation, most of it bad, most of it repeats of what we've seen, but it's just, it feels like the sheer number of states that are trying to pass bans, restrictions, higher tax rates, et cetera, is just, and, and then obviously the, I think a couple big pieces of news with the Reagan Udall Foundation report that came out and the FDA responded to it. And the other one is that Brian King, the new head of, of CTP over at FDA gave a, basically asked me anything, one hour Q and A, where he had some revealing things to say. Hmm. So what did he have to say? Can you educate our audience? <laughs> you know, a lot of it because he's, he, he, he calls himself the least bureaucratic or the most non-bureaucratic bureaucrat you'll ever know. Uh, and he's extremely charismatic. He gives, you know, really nice sounding answers. It does seem at the very least that Brian King, more than some of his predecessors, is truly interested in stakeholder engagement. He is really interested in the FDA used to have public meetings all the time on myriad issues. They would have uh, scientific advisory board uh, meetings where they would give advice to the FDA. And then they, they just kind of stopped doing that even before the pandemic, all of that kind of tapered off. And, and that was a real problem for the public and for the industry you know, during the Reagan Udall Foundation evaluation, which is this independent organization, kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA. They were established by Congress to kind of help the FDA and provide some outside eyes. And they did an evaluation of the tobacco center there at FDA. And one of the things they noted was that there is an opaqueness to decisions that are being made and people, especially outside of the industry, but who are still stakeholders, feel like the FDA is not in listening in any way whatsoever to what they say they need, what they want, how the rules are affecting their lives. And it seems like Brian King is truly interested, at least, in reestablishing those connections and reestablishing some form of public back and forth with the FDA, which I think is really good. And then the other super notable thing is that when he was asked about the youth vaping epidemic in America, he said that he has never called it an epidemic and he's not aware of anybody at the FDA who has called it an epidemic for quite some time. So he didn't say the epidemic is over, but that does sound fairly promising in terms of the narrative that's been pushed in America about since 2018, when youth experimentation with vaping was extremely high, but immediately started declining. Yet the narrative about the epidemic persisted, even though the numbers of youth experimenting with these products are lower than they were in 2014, I think. Yeah. So can you just let our audience know exactly who Brian King is? Not everyone might know. So just go into a bit about what his role is um, and just who he is and what his agenda is. Right. Well, you know, I can't really say, first, honestly, I can't really say what his agenda is. He, he you know, he's been in the FDA for a long time and he's taken yeah. a more, you know, it, it, not a backseat role, but he just hasn't, at least when it comes to tobacco harm reduction, this, this idea, he hasn't spoken much. Although, you know, the other big notable thing that he said, one thing that we, uh, the researchers in this space, the industry, lots of other people have commented, is that when Scott Gottlieb, you know, was the head of the FDA, they had this comprehensive plan. It was supposed to be an FDA-wide approach to tobacco issues generally, and that included, you know, uh, an explicit nod to the continuum of risk and this idea that, yes, we need to protect youth and we need to discourage them from taking up potentially harmful habits, but we have to balance that against the need to push for innovation and safer products and make those safer products available for adults. You know, the off-ramp versus the on-ramp idea. Uh, however, since that comprehensive plan, you know, was presented by Gottlieb, it seemed like to the rest of the world, the FDA completely ignored it. They just dropped it. Uh, Brian King says, you know, and he's the, the uh, he is the director of the Center for Tobacco Products, which is one of, you know, a very powerful um, office within the FDA. Uh, he said that they did not drop that comprehensive plan, okay, but they are also working on a new, I think, five or 10 year comprehensive plan, which they're going to have at the end of this year. And Brian King noted that they're going to be doing some kind of public engagement as they prepare to write this comprehensive plan in the summer. So I think that's something that everybody who has any interest in tobacco, whatever side you're on, should be paying very close attention to that because if the FDA is 
serious about using such a plan and making it their guiding principle, then I think we, we need to have, whether you're a consumer, you're a researcher, advocate, whatever it is, we need to make sure that our voices are heard. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, another topic which caused a lot of heated debate of flavours in tobacco harm reduction. So in February, um, we had a flavours campaign running where, um, you know, we're seeing flavours getting banned or proposals for bans coming in certain European countries, etc. for in alternative tobacco products or nicotine products. Um, which can cause some concern for the THR world, understandably. Um, so back in December, um, we did a flavours webinar with Dr. Konstantinos Varslinos, who is a cardiologist from Greece. Um, and we've been amplifying his flavours review. So he wrote a report and he's updated that report about flavours. Um, and in that webinar, we discussed the update to that report. And we featured Dr. Farslinos and Dr. Chris Russell. So Dr. Russell is a behavioural scientist specialising in tobacco and nicotine use. So in the webinar, Dr. Farslinos spoke about the latest review on flavours. Um, and this goes into the science and the consumer insights, safety and the use of flavours in adult vapours and how we can minimise the risks for youth initi initiation. So you spoke about, you know, youth and the epidemic and it reminded me of this. Um, so back in at the end of 2022, California actually voted to ban sales of almost all flavoured nicotine products. So only hooker and some premium cigars are exempt. And that means the state will become the second after Massachusetts to prohibit retail sales to this extent and the fifth to pass some version of a vape flavour ban. Uh, many adults who use vapes to quit cigarettes find flavours really helpful or even vital in making that switch and, and you know, quitting cigarettes. But that reality has long been drowned out by the national outcry over the youth vaping epidemic. So, so it's been called. Um, Greg Connolly, the director of, Leg of legislative and external affairs at American vapor manufacturers, told Filter Mag, it is a calamity that over 20 million American adults will soon find it easier to buy Marlboros than satisfying smoke free alternatives. Um, so, Michelle, do you have a perspective on flavor? tobacco harm reduction and what would you say to governments who are considering outright bans on flavours if for alternative products to cigarettes or consumer products in general? Yeah I mean any kind of category ban, prohibition, any kind of big sweep is generally just a terrible idea but especially when you're talking about flavours this idea that anything to do with flavours is immediately meant to target youth is an outcropping of the logic behind the Joe Camel ban. So, you know, back in the day when we had cigarette companies using Joe Camel as a cartoon and, you know, parents groups, anti-tobacco people, they said that that was intended to target youth. Was it? Probably. Who knows? I don't know. But either way, that is different than just saying, you know, colors or, you know, colors are meant to hook children. If, you know, if the flavors themselves uh, are named things like Fruity Pebbles. Now, that's something the government can say and be like, whether or not you intended it, uh, this could appeal to children. Why don't you call it something else like fruit, cherry, whatever? Something that's more, but you know, I'm drinking tea right now, and I'm not just drinking tea. I'm drinking lapsang souchong. It has a flavor to it. I like that. And if you think about what you do in your normal life as an adult, anything you do that you consider to be healthy, anything you drink, eat, any kind of medication, uh, what do you do? You know, if you think of vegetables. You're like, I want to eat these because they're healthy. You don't just eat straight vegetables because if you did that, you know, if you put Brussels sprouts in the microwave, you'd be less inclined to eat them again. So you add salt, you add butter, you add cheese, and that helps you engage in the healthier behavior. It encourages you to continue on with this healthier, healthier habit than what you were doing before. And that's the same thing with flavors. There is almost nothing in life that is unflavored that you put in your mouth. It's going to have a flavor. The question is, is it pleasant? Is it neutral? Or is it bad? Uh, and I think the people in government see tobacco flavor as a neutral flavor. It is not. It is not a neutral flavor. It is one that most adults who use, you know, combustible nicotine products become used to because of the feeling of nicotine. But it is not necessarily a flavor that they find pleasant. And this is certainly true when it comes to synthetic versions of that flavor, right? Uh, vapor products, you know, if we're talking completely divorced from the plant of tobacco, you have to add flavor in. If you want to make it taste, nicotine doesn't taste like anything. It tastes sweet. It's an alcohol. So you have to add in a flavor. And most people, not most people, but not everybody likes those. And, you know, Farsalinos' work, Constantinos, love him. Uh, some of his work, some of the survey research that he's done has shown not only that flavors are super important to adults who are using alternative products to encourage them to continue using them instead of relapsing 
back to what they're used to, what they're, you know, the flavor that they've become accustomed to. Uh, but he also showed, and some other surveys have shown this, that the sheer variety that a person uses, the variety of flavors that a person switches between predicts their long-term cessation success. That is not something I think that regulators or anybody who pretends to care about public health, to care about smokers, to care about switching people off of something harmful into a safer lifestyle can ignore. The fact that flavors do play a role for adults one way or the other. If you eliminate the flavors, you only give them one, that's going to have an effect. Or if you give them a variety like you have in the UK, that's going to have an effect as well. The question is positive, negative, balance. We have to balance all these considerations. But right now, it is just pure anti-tobacco, you know, late 1980s panic rhetoric. And honestly, it is much easier for lawmakers, state, local, and federal to just say ban it all than it is to go in and say, well, this ingredient is risky or this ingredient you can't describe the way you can't use this type of language with when describing or marketing flavors. That's very complex and it takes a lot of resources. So bans seem much easier until you actually do them. And I'm not excited about it, but I do really encourage other states to watch what happens in California. Before you do anything in your state or your city or your country, wait and watch and see over the next two to five years what happens in California. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be good. A lot of people are going to suffer. A lot of people are going to go to jail. A lot of people are going to get caught up in some things that they never would have otherwise. A lot of youth are going to be getting not just tobacco products that are illegal for them, but other illicit products that might be being trafficked alongside of these illicit products. It's going to be bad. There are going to be people trying to spin it, that it's not, or it was caused by X, Y, or Z, or you don't have enough enforcement money, whatever. I just beg of everybody else before they emulate that state to wait and watch what happens. Yeah. And anyone watching, um, Michelle is a great tweeter. So anything that happens in California, I'm sure Michelle will be tweeting about it hot off the press. So if anybody wants to have small digestible chunks of information that's put in an interesting way or an interesting spin, read michelle's twitter page <laughs> which is Sorry, talking about, a lot. <laughs> yeah talking about twitter which is really useful because we learn a lot right so talking about twitter so you've been actively tweeting in february um obviously and uh, i saw that you tweeted that alex norcia um who i've seen him at various conferences in you know, gfn he was there actually last year he's a great tobacco harm reduction journalist who actually wrote for filter mag has left journalism and filter mag and he wrote a really interesting article on his reflections of his time in journalism in the past five years in tobacco harm reduction and on the 15th of february you quoted a sentence from his article which stated i wish i could say that i recognize instantly the extent to which a new moral panic was developing but that wouldn't be true it took me some time to realize that we were seeing the early stages of another drug war um, what do you think, what are your thoughts on that statement or his reflections um, and just that piece that he wrote in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I re that really s struck me because it's something that I see all the time. Once you see it, once I think you start to research, you know, the original lead up to the original drug war, to the, uh, you know, beginnings of prohibition, even before that in the, you know, American history, once you recognize the pattern and the rhetoric and the strategy of it, you start to see it and then you start and, and each time it happens in the world it doesn't necessarily result in a moral panic you can see the the attempt to drive a moral panic doesn't always catch fire again campaign for tobacco kids tried this with seizures and i think nicotine mints or something like that or that was e-cigarettes they were trying to link e-cigarettes to seizures uh, and it just never took off <clears throat> but I, I think this happens uh to be very salient right now because of the moment America is in specifically with drugs, you know, we are, I think, the world leading drug prohibitionists, perhaps. Uh, we've exported our prohibitionist attitudes to the rest of the world, and, and all of that has been embedded in systems in other countries around the world. Uh, but in recent years, a huge portion of the American public and the research community has started to pull back from that and talk about harm reduction when it comes to drugs. But I think what you're seeing, even among those, even among that group, it takes a while to recognize those patterns, those prohibitionistic moral panic patterns in other spaces. Uh, so, you know, I came to tobacco harm reduction after writing about gambling and alcohol, and it took me a while to see the connection, not, not too long because I had been in those spaces, but I, I'm hoping that other people will follow 
Alex and look into this and very quickly see what he saw, what I saw, what a lot of us have seen in this space and that it has very little to do with science, has very little to do with public health. It is a moral, rhetorical, ideological battle that's being fought you know, in a public space and the public are the pawns, they are the chips that are being played for, unfortunately. Yeah, and just in the last couple of minutes, um, what's this year looking like for you? Are you going to be at events? Which ones? Are we going to be seeing you in person? Yes, I'm definitely going to be at the Global Forum on Nicotine this year again, one of my favorite conferences. I'm going to be hosting a panel called The Changing Face of Nicotine. Obviously, there's so much work to be done in this space and communicating it and getting more research interest into not just the harms of nicotine, uh, especially the harms of nicotine connected to any kind of tobacco product, but looking at this chemical for the value that it potentially has to human life as, you know, for cessation, but for many, many other things. So I think that's going to be what our, I'm very excited about. It's always such a good group of people and a great conversation and everyone's really just there to exchange ideas, learn, figure out how we can help in the world and uh, help in our local communities. Absolutely. And will you be involved in the COP10 campaigning? No, I don't believe so. Not yet. Cop, cop, the, the COP meetings, you know, the big international uh, the, the meetings yeah. of the parties, it's never something I've been, well, because honestly, they really try and shut everybody out from that. They only truly for a very long time have, they want a bubble. They want everybody there to be on the same page. I mean, you've seen what happened to the Philippines when they turn their back on the World Health Organization's recommendations about tobacco when they said, no, we're not going to ban e-cigarettes. We're actually going to regulate these products and make them available for adults. And they've been treated horribly by the uh, broader European community at the very least. So yeah, I, I, I'm paying attention to it. I'm talking to people who are participating and, and paying even closer attention than I am, but my, I will not be uh, actually physically going there. Okay, yeah, of course. Okay. Well, I'll be seeing you at GFN in June then. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today, Michelle. Um, Thanks for and we'll be amplifying these mini clips and I'll let you know when they're ready on YouTube. Have a great day. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye. Oh.